Hi, it's Scott Alder from Learning and Teaching Services at CQ University Australia. This is an introductory video to the seven principles of good practice in undergraduate education. The seven principles were developed by Arthur Chickering and Zelda Gamson and are based on a meta-analysis of many studies into effective undergraduate education. Some years ago, our university decided to adopt the seven principles as the basis of its teaching and learning framework. This presentation has been designed to help you understand the seven principles. The first principle suggests that we encourage contact between students and faculty. Put simply, the research shows that there's a positive relationship with the level of contact between students and teaching staff and student performance. And the earlier we establish this contact, the better. This contact can be inside the teaching space, online in forums, by email, before and after classes, or on the phone. We know that the more students get to know you, the more inclined they are to ask questions or seek clarification. So make it a point to get to know your students, learn their names, give them positive feedback when it's deserved, correct any misconceptions they may have inside or outside of your class. Also consider designing learning activities that cause them to become better acquainted with you, your teaching team and other students in the course. One of the things you can do is to share a little bit about yourself each time you have contact with your students. This is known as progressive disclosure and helps build trust between teacher and students. The second principle encourages lecturers to develop reciprocity and cooperation among your students. Sometimes students can learn more effectively from other students. It's because they often share a common language and can rephrase or explain what they've learned and the process they went through to gain that understanding. This is especially the case with international students where English is not their first language. Often students will ask each other for help rather than asking the lecturer. They do this to avoid looking stupid or because they seek another way of explaining the content. This kind of student interaction is a good thing and one you should want to encourage. So design some simple activities in the early stages of the course that encourage the students to get to know each other. Also consider asking your students to teach another student a small part of the curriculum and have the other student critique that effort. As teachers we already know that deep learning occurs when we have to teach something to others. It's the same for students. These kinds of learning activities can be in class or online. The third principle relates to using active learning techniques to enhance your student learning. We know from the research that students learn more effectively when they engage in the learning process in ways that cause them to make meaning and apply that learning to different contexts. Contrast, if you will, a student who sits passively in a lecture making notes with another student who is analysing what they're learning and using this to apply the knowledge to another context or to create a product that uses that knowledge. An active approach to learning causes students to learn more deeply and to remember what they've learnt. Have a look at the drawing. Its design has been drawn from the work of Edgar Dale in what was known as Dale's Cone. Try to design your learning activities so these students are in the active zone. The deeper the active learning, the more likely your students will commit this knowledge to long-term memory. Principle 4 relates to the provision of timely feedback. Think back to when you were a student. You're often engaged in learning outside of the classroom and it's possible that at times you may have hit what seemed like to be an impasse. Perhaps you're unable to grasp a concept, solve a problem, or structure an essay the way you would have liked. In class, if you're confident, you can ask the lecturer to clarify the teaching point. Outside the classroom, you have less synchronous options. You can send an email to your lecturer and wait for them to reply. You can post a question to the Moodle forum and hope that a student or one of the teaching staff reply to your question. Or you could find the lecturer later during office hours and hope to get through. If your question is not answered quickly, you most likely feel isolated and that you're unable to cope with the situation. This can lead to disengagement and sometimes to failure, of course, or even program withdrawal. 
When your question is answered promptly, you're able to continue your learning journey successfully. Giving timely feedback is very important for students who are seeking to make meaning of their learning. It's not unusual for students to develop misconceptions of what they're learning. If not corrected quickly, they are more difficult to unlearn and thus slow down the overall learning process. Prompt feedback overcomes these misconceptions. These days, your on-campus and distance students rely heavily on feedback they receive via the Moodle discussion forums. By monitoring the discussion on forums, you can quickly attend to student questions and refer subsequent similar questions to the answers you have given. This is a real time saver for lecturers and it's a good idea to train your students from week one to post their questions to the relevant discussion forums. Often other students will provide the answers before you get a chance to respond and this is good provided the student answers are correct. Principle 5 emphasises the importance of time on task. As you're aware, it's common for new students to under or overestimate the amount of time they should spend on assignments or studying for an exam. This is almost always to the student's detriment and can leave them either under prepared or short of time for other course tasks. Students come to university with a wide variety of expectations in terms of the effort needed and their time management capabilities. Some students believe that a full-time university study load is capable without sacrificing some of their non-university commitments. Other students spend much more time on assignments or exam study than is actually required. Of course, some spend too little. By providing students with clear, time-related guidelines in class, in the course profile, and in the preamble of each assessment task, you're helping the students to better manage their time as well as their personal commitments. It's also a good idea to talk to your students about the law of diminishing returns. By teaching them to recognise when they have met the assessment requirements, you'll save them time and stress. Have a look at the graph. The time wasting interval can be as much or more than it takes to reach an acceptable standard. The sixth principle relates to how you communicate your high expectations to students. Professor Roy Sadler suggests that we as university teachers assume that our students know what we want and the kind of standard we expect in their submissions. Interestingly enough, this is not the case. Most students don't know just what we expect from them. So share examples of the standard of work you expect. Explain your thinking when you're assessing a piece of work. When we show students just what we're expecting, we remove the mystery. And that's what all students want. Our expectations also govern the standard work we receive from students. This is often referred to as a Pygmalion effect. If we expect high performance, more often than not that's what we get. The corollary of this of course is expecting a low standard from students and having those expectations similarly met. Explain to your students that you believe they are capable of achieving great results and believe it. You'll be surprised just what happens. The seventh and final principle relates to the diverse way in which our students learn best. It asks us to respect the diversity of talents and the ways of learning our students bring to our learning spaces. Not everyone learns the same way. We're all unique in so many ways. Some like to read and can create an amazing world of understanding in their heads. This may well be how you learn best. Other people learn more visually and it's the images and processes they see that helps them to understand and learn effectively. Some need to see the whole picture first before they can effectively learn the bits which make up the whole, while others prefer to concentrate on the minutia and follow a sequential learning path with little interest in how it all fits together. Often students need to be in a physical learning environment where they're doing things or creating something using the knowledge and skills they are attaining. Others tend to reflect cognitively on what they've learned and how they might apply what they've learned. At our university, our students have a high level diversity when it comes to the ways in which they learn best. A person's learning style and preferences are not anchored at one end or the other of a continuum, rather they fit between absolutes. So good learning and teaching means that we offer a wide variety of learning experiences that meet students' needs and help them to succeed. 
The seven principles allow you to reflect on your teaching and learning design. They offer proven strategies that will improve student learning across all university education programs of study. No doubt you are already following some of these principles and doing those things well. If you're like me, you can see areas where you can tweak or modify things a bit to gain better student outcomes and improve their feedback on your teaching. If you'd like some help with the design and management of your courses, please contact Learning and Teaching Services on extension 2711 or make contact with a Learning and Teaching Services liaison person for your school. Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation.